Good evening. Hi, Seth. Um, my name is Chagit Balkai. I'm an assistant professor in UL for painting and drawing, painting and foundation. Um, we have a lot of things going on here. So we're here in person in the ACA, the Acadiana Center of the Arts. We have our panelists, which I'm going to introduce in a little bit. We have um, our audience. We have uh, Jake is helping us. We have people on Zoom connecting to us online. Uh, Seth, our, one of our panelists, is on Zoom as well. And we have everything rolling on YouTube. So that's just to make it as complicated as we can, <laughs> as fast as we can. Um, so welcome. This is um, the panel discussion. We called it The Hustle, Life as a Working Artist. Um, we are, today we're going to introduce the awards for our student jury show of the two, 2021 jury student show, curated by Corey Stewart, right here. And we're going to have a discussion with a few questions. We're going to discuss some of the issues about that are related to being, to live in the life of an artist and the kinds of dilemmas that come with it, the kinds of possibilities that are open to us and close to us, possibly a little bit of observation on the art world, and announce the prizes. Corey chose three prizes and our panelists chose each an honorarium. We're gonna hear from you on those. Um, and we have Anne Goodrow. Connect, correct me if I got it wrong. It's perfect. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, we have Troy Douglas and Seth Bronkai. Um, we're gonna show a little bit about them. We're gonna um, introduce each of you. We'll introduce yourself a little bit. And I wanna say thank you for a lot of people. So I'm gonna do that now. Um, so first of all, thanks um, to Paige Krauss from the ACA, Jake from the ACA. Um, and then uh, thank you, Jimmy Tansel, who created a beautiful exhibition online and that you could see and maybe we can put it up. Uh, Jake, yeah? yeah you see I wanna see it now. Okay. And I wanna thank Kevin Hagan and David Dubos who's not here, couldn't be here today. And I think this is it. Am I remembering everyone? I hope so. I know a lot of people have, and Matt Roberts, of course, who's um, filming this for the um, AOC. Thank you. Um, and it's live on YouTube. So with that, yes, the students, of course. Thanks. So with, um, we're going to thank the students in a very deep way by looking at their work and actually honoring their work and talking about why they were chosen. Um, so let's begin by um, a quick introduction, if you will, and we can look at the panel, at the panelists. So this is the show. That's the show. You want you want the um, you want the panelist bios. We're going to start with the panelist bios right now. Yeah. Um, and if you could, we would start with Corey our juror that we're really excited to have here, who won, I heard today, a um, the the Arts Park. Arts Park. Arts Park. Yes. Yes. So yes. cool. You want to tell us about it? Yeah. Okay. So hi, everyone. Um, here and on Zoom and YouTube. Uh, I'm Corey Stewart, also Corey St. Ewart, for artistic reasons. Um, I'm a screenwriter slash visual artist working here in Lafayette. I went to I went to school and graduated from UL in digital and new media art in 2017, and I've just been working 
uh, normal work, like commercial work, uh, service industry, but at night I go home and I write, uh, or paint, or come up with, uh, with sketches and continue on um, to improve my craft. Currently, uh, I'm, I created this nonprofit organization last year called Katiana Black. That was based off of one of my art pieces for a Black History Month art show. Um, the reception for that piece, which was the Acadiana Black Pride flag, uh, had, the reception for it was so big that I um, started a company with it that uh, since then I've given over $3,000 to local black charities. So uh, that's something I'm really proud of. And uh, yeah, I, mean, I was extremely honored and excited to participate in the Jared exhibition because uh, not only is it nice to see that uh, the university sees me as, as an artist and I'm, it's my, it's my uh, alma mater doing that, but uh, I was in the same position as all the students that submitted to the exhibition. I, I know what it was like and uh, I thought it was just so fun in a full circle moment to, to be on the other side of that. And you know, uh, I know how much the Jared exhibition meant to me when uh, when I uh, participated, I, I, I got, I think, second my senior year. Um, and that, that really meant a lot to me, so I was really, really, really happy to make a lot of the students, you know, help them have those same moments as well, too. Okay. Um, we're, very, we're very excited to have you, and um, one of the things that is exciting for us as a committee and, and everyone that was involved is that you do show an example to our students that is inspiring and it's current and it's happening right now um, in the world that you know our students live in today um, as opposed to you know when I was coming out and starting to feel a little bit like I'm coming out of the other side it was years ago things are not the same <laughs> so um and of course who you are and your work i think you know would be very inspiring to our students um so we're happy you're here um we're gonna go with Anne Woodrow next all right <clears throat> you can good evening everyone thank you for having me uh, as a panelist and uh, a participant in this event um Thank you, Corey, for the fine works you chose. Um, I am a uh, sculptor, mostly. I work with fabric and make sculpture and create installations. I also do mixed media work. Um, I have just recently uh, retired from the Lafayette Parish School System and am, alas, back in the studio uh, on a more full-time basis, which has been a long time. But I, um, I reside here in Lafayette. I also, I went to USL uh, for undergraduate and uh, went to the University of South Carolina for my graduate work and have lived uh, between New Orleans, Baton Rouge and Lafayette for the last, all my life, for the last all my life with a little jaunt in South Carolina. So I, uh, I, enjoyed the work and uh, look forward to seeing it and participating in the discussion. Thank y'all. Thank you. Troy. Hi, Hi. Uh, thank you for inviting me, um, getting me out of my box. Uh, it feels a little strange, actually, I just haven't really been out much um, and I don't really get out much. <laughs> And, uh, and it's, it's, you know, I think people, there was a time probably 10 years ago when um, I used to get invited to do this quite a lot and I felt a lot more comfortable back then than I do now. <laughs> and so, um, it just feels like it's been a little while. But I also went to school at UL, uh, USL uh, in 94 uh, and then went to graduate school in New York at Pratt. And I, I would like, probably like to talk more about that to you guys. I think that might be helpful for your students. Um, and that's why, as hard as this is sometimes for me to do, it, it is kind of about um, helping students see and maybe inspiring them a little bit, um, not to get discouraged, because it is a long, long journey. Um, and that's kind of why, why I came. Um, 
Um, thank you so much. Also, I'm, I'm a teacher at, in Lafayette Parish School System in the Gifted and Talented program, um, which has been pretty incredible for keeping me steady and uh, working. Um, it's kind of nice to have a balance of those things. So I, I think it's really important to have balance. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm so curious to have this conversation because I want to know what you all think about all of these problems. Um, so, let's see how that works. Make sure you talk into your audience. Okay. Can you can hear you me? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. You can? Okay. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I'm Michael Yes. Yes. You're the best. There is a, uh, a very odd delay, so it's very strange. <laughs> but it's all very strange. I think that's the good thing about me anymore. Gotta keep it strange. Um, my name is uh, Seth Sakuchai, and most people know Seth, and it's a little bit easier. I'm um, currently based in New Orleans. Uh, I have a, a long and varied background with, in arts and education, uh, and uh, a friend of mine last year dubbed me the creative nomad, which essentially means that uh, I have no particular medium uh, I am in love with other than drawing and painting. But for the past 15 years, my primary uh, mode of work has been in the performance and lens-based uh, materials. So time-based <coughs> pictures or time-based videos and sound objects. Uh, but I also dabble in installation and, uh, and text art. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I want to thank the, the folks at ACA and UL. And of course, it's been really fun looking at all this work. Uh, the students made. That's been a blast. Uh, I've talked with Anne Boudreau and Jenny uh, in the past. We've known each other quite a while. So they know my love of education and, uh, and seeing student work always makes me happy. Uh, unfortunately, I've not been teaching for the past several years, but this is going to be a fun conversation and hopefully uh, enlightening to uh, for the students attending. Uh, uh, it's going to be great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Seth. Um, and since we all came here to see the students' work and to honor the students' work, can we see a little scroll through our gallery? You know, when I was picking through the pieces, I was really upset that you know I wasn't going to be able to see a lot of um, or any of these pieces in in, in real life. Um, I honestly thought it was just going to be piece, like pictures on a web page. So when I saw that it was in a virtual gallery space, I was really, really surprised and like pleasantly surprised. But that's also because of my, you know, I love video games. Video so. <laughs> games. Thank you, Jimmy. It, Jimmy, did you, Jimmy, did you design this? That, did I hear that correctly? This one right here. Yeah, you designed it. This is uh, from Morgan Z. Munzee. Oh, he's talking about the exhibition. Oh, the, the exhibition. I'm, I'm talking about the space itself. Sorry, Kunst Matrix is the name of the company. Uh, <laughs> so the website's up on the left? Yeah, up on the top. Ah, uh, gotcha. <coughs> yeah. Um, Seth. Can I chime in for a second? Is that cool? Sure. Is that, is that how it's working? <laughs> um, I agree with that. what Corey said. It's one of the cool things about the modern art world is the reach that, uh, that artists can have now. Um, I've been able to share this gallery with some friends and colleagues 
But we do a lot of teachers, actually. We just wanted to show them what you guys were doing. But, um, they were really excited. It was really, they did a really joint gallery um, to see the work that, that the students were doing there. Thank you, sir. And how many pieces total? I think there were 60 something. 62. Yeah, we had a pretty good, I think it was 160 or something like that application pieces. So that was for you guys all a tough decision. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we are here in this crazy world, so we're going to do it crazy this year. <laughs> Did you have some, some um, certain things that kind of threaded them together, or was it more um, visually kind of? Far, did, are you asking whether I was thinking about a, a theme or just kind of constructing a show in yeah, mind? Yeah, you were kind of uh, selecting pieces. Uh, no, I initially thought about that, but, and I, I would have done that if, the, if this was in a real space, um, uh, that's always something to keep in mind. But I thought it's it's virtual, um, which means there's really no limitations on what pieces I can pick. So uh, I generally just judge them by by the work itself and, and what the artist was saying and. Do you feel like when you're looking at now, after the fact, you're seeing sort of your kind of like a, ch a reason of why things were chosen or a theme that is sort of coming up to you? Or do you feel like it's kind of a widespread? You know, I'll, I'll have to say that I, a big thing was playing, like I said, I was in their places. I remember what these shows looked, looked like. So a big thing that was popping up in my head was I want to create a show that is an exhibition of the College of Visual Arts, which is what the Jared exhibition was to me. It was you saw paintings, you saw animation, you saw media, you saw sculpting, you saw pottery, graphic design, and that was like really cool. Next to the senior thesis exhibition, this is the next thing far as advertising what the university is really pumping out and creating when it comes to its artists. Mm -hmm. So that, that, I would say that was the closest to a theme that I was going with is just kind of an exhibition showing what, you know, what, what is being created at the University of Louisiana Lafayette mm -hmm. and off of my memory of what I saw um, as my time as a student. Yes. One of the things that we're really proud about is the ability of our students to move between media and to be able to basically, you know, learn one skill set and then apply it to another medium mm -hmm. and, and just create an environment that is an intersection between variety of medias in different ways. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, that's something that the university should be proud of, and then yeah. more certainly that the, the art students themselves should definitely be proud of. I uh, like to think uh, a good art school isn't a trade school. It's not there to teach art students one specific discipline. It's there to teach art students how to express themselves, and whether that's in one specific discipline that they so choose, or multiple ones, uh, that's there for them because that's what an artist does. That's what they excel at, is expressing themselves and thoughts and ideas. And a good art school teaches those students how to do that. Express themselves. So, you know, this is a really interesting, a good point in my mind to move into the next section. Because mm -hmm. you're learning how to express yourself. <laughs> you, you figure out how to navigate the art school. And now you know you, you know how to do that. You have maybe a personal skill set, and you go out there, you know. Mm -hmm. And maybe you have a little bit of a delay because you're doing an MFA, or you have something that is sort of like riding the wave of your BFA or your you know your first degree in some sense. Mm -hmm. But eventually, you need to start sort of, and that's the way I see it. I want to know how you 
would, you know, what your take would be on that. You need to start sort of reinvent yourself and do that again and again and again. Seth, I'm sorry, I'm like moving back and forth. You're all fine. And so um, I, well, we were really curious when we were thinking about what we're going to have this conversation about. Um, we were thinking about, you know, our students and the choices that you guys are making and the concerns that, you know, I, I hear from students and I know, you know, some of my friends, I know that I had them that are always there. Um, with the main question is how do I create for myself this kind of life when I make art and I'm able to express myself or I'm able to to explore th things through art and still pay my bills and hmm. have a place in society and have a, you know life and you know connect to culture in different ways so I pulled up a few questions for you things that um, that I'm you know that we're curious about and I just want to see what you guys are thinking so my my starting point um, is, is to think back and tell us about a certain turning point um, in your path when you made a choice that maybe changed your life or changed the path of your career. And maybe you didn't know that it was that important at the time, but it, it was. So I'm just curious to hear if you have anything to say about that, like a moment what was the choice and what was the change that um, it created in your career? And we're going to start with Seth. If we can. Seth? Can you hear us? I'm unmuting here. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I'm uh, going to ask these questions you sent are pretty funny in the sense that those are things I've not thought about it in a long time. Uh, I think a lot, a lot of um, working artists um, have been working as an artist or as a parallel career, which is a lot of the early uh, <clears throat> coincidences or, uh, or events that sort of shaped my path. I haven't even uh, really visited those memories in a while. But um, I can say that uh, for me, I, I wouldn't say there was one thing that set me on the path I'm on, there were certain turning points in my, my uh, journey as a student, to a graduate, uh, to an artist, to a teacher that uh, were, were sort of direct. But I can't say there were two things that, uh, that happened uh, that definitely um, pushed me forward, uh, gave me, uh, I guess, inspiration. Uh, or, or allowed me to uh, uh, allow the courage, me the courage to go ahead and take the leap. Uh, one was um, not long after I graduated, undergraduate. I have a, I have a degree in, uh, I have my, my MFA and undergraduate degrees in painting as well. Um, I was invited to uh, participate in this. Uh, Contemporary Art Biennial in Jackson, Mississippi, at the Mississippi Museum of Art. This is a long time ago. <laughs> so I don't even know if the internet existed. So, uh, as it um, and that was great because I submitted something that was my first truly conceptual piece where it wasn't just an object on the wall, it was a space uh, in, in action. So that was great. That, um, at that point in my sort of early career, I was already represented by a couple of galleries. I was making these, in these paintings that I don't even do anymore. These represent, representative sort of landscapes and portraits, very traditional things. Uh, but that, that event uh, led me sort of uh, tell myself, you know what, I can just make what I want to make. And I did. Which led me to the second thing, which was being dropped by my galleries because I no longer sort of fit into the mold that they need. And, 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 and you know, it took me a long time to understand they are in a business, uh, and that's something that I've learned very quickly. Okay. So, those two events, getting into this exhibition and then being released by the galleries, uh, sort of took me on the path that I've been on for the longest time, which is. Uh, 
instruction as a just having a normal sort of a day job and then also pursuing a career in the arts that has afforded me this sort of freedom in a way uh, where my day job let me not worry about my, my art career. So that sort of grew uh, naturally. So my, my endeavors and interest in art making sort of parallel with what I was doing at the time. So I think that, that would be it for those two events. That's interesting. So would you say that your having a, a day job gave you some kind of freedom in your practice as an artist? Compared um, to working... It taught, me, it taught me something super important that I used to try to instill in my students, that regardless if you're maintaining a day job and being an artist or you're an artist full time, you have to approach approach it as a business, as a sort of entrepreneurial. If you're an artist full time, you, you have to put in the work, you have to put in the time, the hours. If you're doing, for example, I decided on a career in education in the arts, and then also made art very serious about both. Uh, that forced me to be very organized, which is not something I naturally have. Uh, I have spent many hours watching television, but not doing still, still do. Uh, but it forced me to really take a step back and assess what my my goals were as an art maker and as an educator, and that it really helped in that, in that regard. Um, it also introduced me to a lot of um, uh, other people and techniques, and just opened my eyes to seeing that, in a lot of ways, everything I was interested in professionally and artistically were kind of connected. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. So, Troy. Uh, okay, so that's a, that's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> I only have those kinds. It, it's big, and, it, and my answer is pretty big. Um, okay. and, and a bit serious. And, and I think when somebody asks these young people the turning point, I think they're going to think about 2020 and the pandemic because sometimes things force you to do things. Um, so in 2001, I'd already been in New York for about seven years, uh, one going to grad school. Um, <clears throat> I was also very lucky um, to have a career in design fields. Uh, I did fashion for a few years for uh, Macy's, designing children's clothes. Uh, so I got to uh, create dinosaur shirts and prints for um, pajamas and swimsuits, <laughs> really up my alley. Um, well, honestly, because when I was about 15, I wanted to be a fashion designer. Uh, and so it kind of, like you said, Corey, full circles always happen in your life if you keep going. Um, I was able to work and do this thing that I had a passion for when I was very young. Um, and it, it came back to me in full force. And I was actually really good at it and kind of surprised I was able to make a living and make my work in New York City. So I could buy all the shoes I wanted. I could, you know, it just was really fun. Um, uh, at the same time, you know, um, after that, I got another job with Nickelodeon Digital Studios, and I was a lead designer for um, Blue's Clues at the time. Uh, and that was the last three years in New York. Um, I was also illustrating a book for Simon & Schuster. I was having group shows in nonprofit spaces. I basically was having the life. I mean, I achieved everything I wanted, and probably more than I ever thought. So, um, of course, working that much is hard to keep your art going, but um, I was doing a little of everything um, and, and feeling pretty good about, feeling pretty good about it. Um, so 9-11 happens, like when all of this is happening, really shook me up, because um, all these things were happening, all these wonderful things were happening. I was a lead designer on a show, I was illustrating a book, I was having shows, you know, in some pretty cool nonprofit spaces in Brooklyn. Um, that were really edgy and fun. Um, so I was getting a little bit of taste of everything, uh, but that really stopped, stopped, I mean, like the pandemic, it's, it stops you cold in your tracks. So what do you do? Do you stay and stick it out, you know? Or do you say, you know, I've done everything I came here to do. Uh, I think, and you know, another thing, uh, one day I was going to work, it was a very difficult time for everyone, but, um, I lived in Brooklyn and I would take the subway, the L train under the river, and then go up to uh, Times Square to go to the studios. 
Uh, but the, one morning, the train got stuck under the river, lights went out, and cloud of smoke. And this was like a few days after 9-11. So I really thought I was going to like die in that train. Um, and, I, and I just kept thinking, if I get out of here, I'm going home. And that's pretty much what happened. Um, you know, by the end of the year, we were back here by Christmas. Um, and so, you know, what happened, and I think that this is, this time in my life is, has everything to do with what I'm doing now, everything, because I, I thank you, UL, uh, for giving me my first teaching job <laughs> as an adjunct instructor. Uh, so I started teaching at UL, and my work really started to develop. I don't know what it was, but I just let myself make the work I wanted to make, and it just blossomed. And it, it really kept me busy for about 15 years, that research that I did in that, uh, this little house we found right on the Vermilion River. It was like a camp. I mean, going from Brooklyn to a camp on the Vermilion River was very jarring. And then at the same time, I really never wanted to be a teacher. Um, and I actually avoided every education class I could. could. Uh, I never got it. Um, but um, I absolutely loved teaching at the university because I, had, I did not realize I had gained so much freaking knowledge <laughs> from working in these industries in a practical way that I could provide these students with real skills. So I really gave everything I had, everything I knew, and I love those students, and I'm still friends with a lot of those kids, and, they're, and I love watching them um, pursue their career and, and doing wonderful things. So, so that was the turning point where I began to teach, and my teaching overlapped my artwork because I would give my students my problems. So, <laughs> so then, you know, I was like, hey, what, I'm thinking about this, what would you do with it? So, so I, that's, what, that's sort of where I am now. I still, still feel like that is the seed that was planted that is still going very, very strong in my life. My studio and my teaching are overlapping. Uh, now I teach second grade through 12th grade. Very different, um, very wonderful being able to go from school to school, from age to age. They all have their own individual problems. I'm getting that, <laughs> but um, it, it's a lot of fun. Um, I recently learned how to punch needle with yarn. And so guess what, kids? You want to make rugs? We're making rugs, and it's really fun. And the kids are eating it up. Uh, and you know, I learned it a little too late, and I gave the project late in the year. So I'm like, and we're about to have a show. So I'm like, go and get them double time. Punch those rugs, kids. We're having a show. So anyway, um, I, I just feel like that was the <coughs> turning point. Not very easy for me to answer that question because uh, it's clear as day. And I think a lot of these kids will have the same response 20 years from now. In this year. Yeah. in this year yeah that's the clarity that just can only come from the outside is what i'm hearing sometimes things force you in a direction you know and you gotta go you know it's some things are bigger than you you know got got to make it work you know i think i would have made it work if i stayed i think it would you know it, it's sort of like it would have worked you know i think you have to think it's gonna work you know yeah um, yeah, it sounds almost like, I don't know if a divine, but some kind of an inspiration that comes, like intervention it's an end, from yeah. the outside. It changes your direction. Yeah. It does. It really does change your direction. Amazing. You know, and it's out of your control. And sometimes you letting go and letting go of the control is really mm. the answer, mm. you know. Thank you. Corey, <laughs> <laughs> you're the youngest, so... Good luck. I know, right? And, and I'm going to, I feel a bit self-conscious about how uh, rel relative, like how recent my big changing moment was, uh, which happened uh, last year. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I have to say, I, I started college as a computer science major, and the first moment I stepped into Fletcher Hall, it, I had a spiritual experience, and I was like, this is where I need to be. <laughs> just saw a bunch of kids, just like crafting things with colored hair. I'm like, oh, this is my people. <laughs> um, That's very important. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it just felt uh, just felt right. Um, 
but no, last year in, in 2020, uh, started off rough. I mean, this is pre-pandemic in January. I had just moved out of uh, my studio downtown. And I felt pretty disconnected from the, the artist community here. And uh, I had some friends who were part of a collective called Willingly Rejected. And they were doing a Black History Month show at the Blue Moon Saloon. And they asked me to make a piece for it. Uh, I don't know why. I just, uh, I mean, I, I love the community here. I love the place. And I love my black heritage. So I decided to combine all those things and make the Acadiana Black Pride flag, which was taking the Acadiana flag. You, you could see it um, me draped in it in, in the picture for my um, bio. Can you put this up? Made it that. Um, brought it there. You know, some people liked it. Uh, and I actually had intentions to just sell the flag that right there. Um, uh, sell the flag and maybe just like a, some t-shirts of it and I had a little pre-order sheet and no one, no one signed up for it or anything. But I, but I wasn't too deterred. I was just going to do it anyway. Um, then pandemic happened. That slowed a lot of things down. And in May, or late May, that's when George Floyd happened. And the whole world got revved up, and I had my Katie and a Black Pride flag, the only one that was in existence at the time, and I brought it to the first protest. And uh, my friend, she's a big raver, so she had a flagpole, so I just borrowed her flagpole and put my flag up in it, and it was waving high, and it was, <coughs> next thing I know, it's on every paper from here to Baton Rouge. And people are asking me, uh, where can I get it? And I was like, I made it, but uh, I'll start selling it soon. So that's when I started A Kitty and a Black. It's made a whole website, so I had to learn a lot of things real quick about business and website management and just uh, all the things about commerce and this stuff. Uh, so I made a whole website, made stickers, shirts, um, decals, just using some of my creative ability to, to provide things. and. Uh, you talk about moments of, of, of force, um, right? And really, I didn't need to start Acadiana Black. I mean, I could have easily just like brought it out. I could, I could have just not done, the, brought the flag out. Um, but I, I, something was in me that was just like, oh, people want this thing, so I need to provide it for them. And I did. Uh, did it. Reception was huge. And that just all of last year just sold hundreds of products, made more products and did really well just using my creativity like that and kind of rechanneling and repurposing my art uh, or my, my artistic ability uh, to, you know, to, to, to service people. That's what it felt like. And I think that's why I bring it up as a really big change um, for, for me. Uh, I heard someone say, being an artist is being a public servant. And I never looked at art that way, since art has always been so self-expression for me. Uh, I never viewed it as I'm, I'm a public servant. And it wasn't until Acadiana Black was up and running and people were coming up to me and telling me how much my work that I created or the, how much they appreciated for them. And I mean, Tons of stories like that. Uh, is, uh, I had to deliver a flag to a nice lesbian couple here in Lafayette, and they had just moved to Lafayette from 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 Austin, and they were just looking for something like that. They were looking for it, and th th they were telling me how much they appreciate it, and that really really opened me up as an artist. And um, since then, I've told other artists and uh, uh, some art students of seeing art as a as a public service as your art as a public service and how valuable being an artist is i think for as us in society it's easier to kind of imagine musicians taking that role we can all um imagine those times where music has helped us uh, feel out or express some kind of emotion that we didn't really know how to or have the words to but we were really feeling it and uh, being a visual artist is the same way. Um, that's the reason why there's galleries all across the world. And it's you, but it's you that could help other people feel certain things or 
start conversations. Uh, my art court was starting conversations before Katie and a Black, but the thousands that did when I, you know, when I did create a Katie and a Black, and that just brought in a whole new perspective of me of what being a visual artist, being a visual artist is, and what our place can be in the world, um, particularly in our in our local communities, and what kind of impact we can have. Wow, you're sending it to different places. I'm hearing um, we have the power, we're learning, um, and we're gaining a certain kind of power with this way, ability to express, to express ourselves. And what I'm hearing is, all right, now that you have it, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, this is more of, um, I think, Jake mentioned the, yes, you, I, the, the notion of a citizen artist. So an, an artist as someone situated in a community as you know, part of an internal part of this job or this role of being an artist. I'm really hearing it there. I'm also hearing something between luck, like being in the right place in the right time, which is interesting to think about how you design your life in this way. Um, but it's not only like it's you act it, you're pulled to act and how many times did I f feel pulled to act and I didn't act, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's really what, where it sends me. So. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was a kind of a general theme that a lot of us felt uh, during yeah. last year, yeah, just action that. and inaction and mm -hmm. really going through that, right. figuring that out. A big moment. Yes. Um, and joining big moments is one is you know is important is powerful. But it's also I would add if you have a tiny moment or a really intimate moment or mm -hmm. you're responding to something that is not part of a big movement, that's you know you could be that art you know that um, social servant yeah. or you know public servant just in the same way. But maybe you're speaking to things that are on the margins happening, yeah. right? Yeah, so. and the, the flag was created in a very micro moment for a mm -hmm. very one-off show months before it became known around the city, right? And it's going to what you say of, you know, just creating for yourself small moments. Um, and then I, I made it because I wanted to see that. Um, it was very personal to me, and mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was going to become at all. Uh, and I think part of that, that being in the right time in the right place is uh, having something ready for that right time and right mm -hmm. place. And you can't just say, oh, I'm going to have something ready. You just have to create, right? As artists, that's what we, we need to do. It feels right. So I needed to create for a show, and I, and, and I did. And it was already there. And it... Uh, yeah, it, it Without blew up the years of, of doing the work, it wouldn't have happened. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it already existed, and that that opened up so many avenues to explore myself, and so many avenues for people to kind of yeah. feel things that they hadn't felt before. Thank you. Um, yes. 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 Well, um, my turning point didn't start at this point, but. You're, you took advantage of your, your point in time, and as, did, uh, as we all do. But my dad told me something right when I'd gotten out of undergrad, finished up at USL in photography, and I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing with my life, Dad. And he's like, Annie, whatever you're doing, and at the time, I was cleaning houses, tending bar, and working for a photographer, okay? Piecing it together. And he says, whether you're cleaning the toilet, ser serving a drink, or developing an image, just do it the best you can. Keep your eyes and your ears open, and things will happen. And I swear to you, students listening, I did not look back. And I just took his advice and went with it. And I ended up working with Herman Meir at the University Arts Museum. That was a dead end position. Took on the directorship of the Baton Rouge Gallery, nonprofit art space uh, in Baton Rouge City Park. And at that time, we were developing. Um, and we were beefing up the education program. And I was concurrently finding my voice as an artist. And I had finished school a good six years before that, but just 
hadn't really found my voice. I was doing mixed media collages. And um, through the education component of uh, the, my, my, my work at the Baton Rouge Gallery, I discovered that I loved talking to the students. And I would dress appropriately if they were young kids. I'd wear pearls and a nice white blouse. Or if they were high schoolers, I'd show them a little hairy armpit with my heavy earrings and, you know, like, yeah, yeah. And it was really, that's when I realized teaching is theater. I like this. And, uh, and that, at that time, that was my turning point. I was like, I'm going back to school. So at 35, I went back for my MFA because I said, if I get that degree, I know I can open other doors teaching. And I didn't really want to do the art ed thing. So I wanted to focus on my art making practice, which I was really, I was a late bloomer and I was just coming into. So that was truly the, the turning point uh, in the early 90s and uh, early mid 90s. And then that MFA did open many doors. I taught adjunct for years. I received a fellowship from the state of South Carolina. I exhibited all over South Carolina indulged myself in adjunct hell, but loved it because it gave me a lot of freedom as an artist. And I did a lot of organization of uh, installation events. And I was making, uh, I went from making two dimensional work to relief work to three dimensional work to installation. Um, that's something I, uh, that I still like changing things up and uh, let, letting my practice develop. But that, that was my point figuring out that, hey, I can teach. I definitely did not want to pursue arts administration on a long-term basis, but I really wanted to do research and spend that, and, and those three years of graduate school, I have to say were some of my favorite years in my entire life. Um, so the research and the exploration and discovering more about who I was and what processes I wanted to push out in, in directions I wanted to push out in, uh, it, it really opened up uh, my life as an artist. That's it. Wow. Thank you You're welcome. for that. It sounds like when you're ready, it just flies, right? Yeah, and yeah. I did what my dad said. I kept my eyes open, and I kept my ears open, and I picked up on this opportunity or that opportunity mm -hmm. and uh, I had a lot of energy too. I mean, I still do. You but. still do, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, I have to say. Thanks. I'm going to go straight to the next question. What is success to you as an artist? And let's keep the round. The microphone. Seth, what is success to you as an artist? Um, you know, I have to say that changes depending on the week. I had a really great teacher uh, in undergraduate who uh, was an amazing, an amazing painter and draft person. And his goal was to finish a drawing every month. And he had been doing that for 30 or 40 years. And his drawings all ended up underneath the bed. So they, 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 never, they never saw the light of day until maybe five years before he passed away. Um, I, I do remember having these conversations with him. And uh, he always said to me, you know, this is, this is my way of uh, uh, being successful as an artist, that I have satisfied my need to make something. And I kind of took that to heart uh, for for a while um, because, as I mentioned before, you know, I went out of grad school for undergraduate as a painter, you know, making a living for as an artist. Um, so I thought that was the thing. Like, I'm gonna make art, I'm gonna make this. But really, um, what I discovered was that success as an artist for me is, is two things. One is being able to do, to make it. Like make art and express myself or come up with some crazy idea and see it from inception to vision to 
somehow I'm getting into this group, uh, getting it out there. Um, and I've been really uh, privileged over the years to, even though I, for the longest time, turned down gallery offers and didn't pursue galleries, um, I was always exhibiting because I was always being invited to show. And I felt that that's kind of all I needed um, to, to sort of that acknowledgement. But, but for me, being successful is being able to come up with an idea and actually see it through. Um, I always, until recently, um, this is a part of that profession. Um, uh, until very recently, like I said, I never really cared about being with the other. Now that things are different, I kind of want to get back into that. So I'm, I'm actually um, trying to actively uh, reconnect with that world. I'm trying to learn how to do that again. So that, that's kind of, uh, part of the process of being a business person or being an artist that you've got to you know, think of where you are in your career. So, uh, but anyway, the, like I said, the, for me, being able to make things uh, and being able to um, challenge myself, that, that, that kind of defines my success uh, as an art person. Thanks. I'm imagining a bed made out of drawings after 30 years. <laughs> So being able to hundreds <laughs> of these beautiful sleep uh, on them. They're highly rendered eight by four by crystal. It was they're incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. Amazing, amazing artist. Wow, okay. It changes and being able to make art. We're gonna all have the same answer in the end. <laughs> Is that what's gonna happen? <laughs> Troy. Um. let's see. So uh, I, I was thinking about it, and, and I, I re I, for me, success is being able to add up all the small successes over the years. Because um, not one of those successes really changed my life in any significant way, no matter how big or small they were. So you students today, congratulations. That's a success. And that should be, part, that should be the building block for the next success. And it builds, and it builds, and it builds. And then, you know, 30 years later, you know, you, you probably got a few successes along the way. Um, it, it might, and it might feel like there's a lot of failures, too. And I, I honestly say, think, I feel like I'm failing more than I'm succeeding. But when I look at the, at the long view, um, all of these little things really add up to something. But not one of them ever changed my life. It might be different for you. Maybe your flag has completely changed your life, you know, and it's a big, big success, you know, and, and it, it, it just catapults you into this, you know, nothing has ever catapulted me into this next phase. I've just been doing the same thing for a really long time. And of course, there's been some really highlights, you know, some things that, um, <clears throat> one, I was thinking, something that I, I really feel pretty proud about is being included in a catalog uh, called Optical and Visionary Art since the 60s. Um, and it's a beautiful catalog by um, David Rubin. Uh, and there, I'm, in, I'm in this catalog, and then there's Frank Stella, there's Fred Tomaselli, there's Andy Warhol, there's me. Guess what? It's a beautiful catalog. I was really proud of it. It did nothing for my career. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Um, so, you know, it, it's strange, you know, because you, you just think that it, if I just got that show, it would change my life. If I just get into this catalog, it'll change my life. Not one thing <laughs> changes your life ever. Um, so that's just how I feel. I, I think that being able to stay steady is, and being able to balance, we were talking about balance earlier, balance your life. All, you know, kind of all the way around so that you can keep doing what you love to do. I mean, even if you have to serve coffee or, or you know, clean a house, whatever you have to do, you know, I think um, you'll have those successes um, and they'll build up. So you just have to stick with it. Thanks. I'm here in health study, but mainly the adding here, the sense of progress. Progress. Long-term progress Long -term. that gives sort of meaning to the whole process. Because you could, you could give up so easily and be yeah. so discouraged because that thing didn't take you, you know, where you thought it would. Because mm -hmm. um, nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's sort of like, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, that's kind of how I, I'm starting to look at it now at this point in my life. Thanks. Corey. 
so I also thought about this question really, really hard. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have led several really successful groups slash organizations when I was in college. And the thing I always told the members of the organization is that it doesn't have to be successful, it just has to happen. And that within itself is a success. Mm -hmm. And I think of you being an artist the same way. Your piece doesn't have to make it into a gallery. People don't even have to like it. You don't even have to like it. It just has to happen. You just have to do it. You have to do something, literally anything. If you just do it, that, that within itself is successful because you're being an artist, you're creating. And I think even creation, like, um, oh, if I didn't draw today, that means I failed as an artist um, because I didn't do something. Uh, I, I don't think it's that binary as in do or don't do. Um, if you may not have drawn today, but did you read something that was interesting to you? Did you watch something that made you feel something? I think the greatest thing about being an artist is uh, being able to invest in yourself and what you feel and what you know and how you want to express that into the world. So, so long as an artist continues to do that, I think they're being successful because that will ultimately um, turn it into the next piece that they'll create. Right, um, seeing the news articles or things that are happening in the world or around them and makes them feel something. And that's what will inspire them to create. Or just taking a walk in the park because you needed it. Because you wanted to just kind of explore yourself inwardly. And do you need to sketch out the beautiful trees that you see? Yeah, it could be nice. It would be nice. I would like to see that. Other people would because that's what artists are for, right? Public servant. But if you don't, it's not that big of a deal. You did something for yourself. You're getting to know yourself. And the self of an artist, to me, is the most important. Um, I don't think we care about Andy Warhol's soup can because we love soup. I think we care because we care about Andy Warhol. And you could say the same thing for any of the artists that you see up in MoMA and Guggenheim and wherever else, you know, the people that all the art students are spending all this time studying. It's, it's the, particularly in contemporary art too, it's the artists that, that themselves that make the piece. Without the artist, it's just a paperweight. It's just another object. Mm -hmm. It's just this microphone. I mean, this is a nice microphone. I do like the design, but... It's a work of art. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you, if you told me, uh, you know, insert artist here, like Franz Klein or, you know, Gustav Klimt made this microphone, I'm like, ooh, <laughs> this is, this is Klimt. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, so you see, just, that's just uh, an example of, uh, the dynamic of what the artist brings to the piece and what the artist is is a person so uh, to me that's what being a successful artist is is a person that is successful in investing in themselves on a regular basis yeah thanks sounds to me as a a shift kind of consistent and opposite at the same time to what you said before consistent a shift from the object into the life around it and opposite in the sense of you see yourself as a public servant but what i'm hearing here is invest invest in the system <laughs> yes yeah i mean um, invest in yourself and that's where things are coming from and yeah exactly i mean people listen to taylor swift every day because taylor i mean at the end of the day taylor swift is just talking about her life right but people are like yes i need to listen to more of her talk about her life and i view being an artist the same it's just creating based off of your life and how that can resonate with people right and that things don't have meaning by themselves they have meaning through the the networks that are created around them and so invest in those rather than focus on that right thank you and yes um <coughs> 
Well, I, I don't judge uh, my success as an artist monetarily, and that's a really good thing. <laughs> I'd be sorely disappointed. I have, <laughs> I mean, I've sold work, but it totally does not have anything to do with that. I'm, I'm with Troy on the little things that add up, but I feel like what is so successful for me is creating this lifestyle of being able to teach what I do and from the experiences I've had to, to teach young, and I've taught uh, adjunct college many different uh, courses, and I've taught middle school, high school, um, but to share that while making art that is not, that I chose not to try to make a living on my art. I think it would have really stressed me out to no end. And so my creativity, uh, the success is just being able to make art, to play, and to come up with the things I come up with. And sometimes I wonder, where is this coming from? And sometimes I don't know, but just having that opportunity to be a creative being. Not everybody has a life situation where they can do it, nor do they have the ability to manifest ideas. So I just feel like not being chained into having to live on my work, because that would have made me crazy, and um, being in communities of art, like in South Louisiana, South Carolina, regionally, I have not shown that far and wide, but where I have shown, I have followers and uh, communities. So I think for me, it's a, the connectivity of, in the cultural space and the ability to make things that I want to make without having to fit into any box or construct or, 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 or uh, uh, economical con con construct or uh, anything that is mainstream or limiting. Not that I'm way out there, but I just feel I have a great breath of freedom to create. Internal. Mm -hmm. Internal success, yeah. We're, that's why we're all here, right? Mm -hmm. We love something. We love doing something. Enough to construct our lives around it in some ways. Thanks. Um, I'm debating if I'm gonna put two questions together or we're gonna have two more. Can I have some input from the timekeepers? Oh man, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love both questions, that's the problem. Okay, what you got? Jiang Jiang, three and four. Oh, okay, okay. I can put them together, right? Yeah, you can put that together. Um, um, do you wanna ask them? Sure, okay, right. so. <laughs> and y'all make sure to talk into the mics. So. Um, the question is, being an artist today, uh, in today's world, what does it allow you to do? And if you could change something about that, what would it be? Seth. Seth first. Um, uh, combine them? Is that right? Well, just, uh, um, yeah, uh, you know. Right now is finding the best 
way that you're comfortable with getting your work out there. Um, and um, as far as what I would change, I think it's kind of happening uh, right now, and a lot of it has to do with technology, I guess. It's, it's, it's controlling how your work is marketed and, and what you can do with it on the secondary market, where auction houses control that market where the value of your work increases, but your your reward from that 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 work doesn't increase, which is kind of normal. Um, so I have an anecdote actually of this band and it has to do with the gallery that Jimmy set up for the art for the show right now actually. Anyway, um, here in New Orleans we have uh, something called the New Orleans Photo Alliance, and we put on a uh, festival every year called Photo Nova. Uh, we've been doing it for 15 years now. It's uh, it's crazy, and uh, nobody outside of New Orleans, outside of uh, I'm sorry, everybody outside of Louisiana has heard of it, but no one in Louisiana is. Um, so last year, like everybody else, we did our festival virtually, and we worked with a company called Meta Culture, M-E-T-A-C-L-C-U-L-T-U-R-E. Look them up, they're an amazing group of people that create uh, VR experiences, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality experiences. They built us a uh, virtual gallery in which you had to put on the Oculus to experience, uh, which I did not care for, but it was pretty. It was fun for everybody else. Uh, this is a this is an opening event we have every year um, for the past 15 years, and this year we had oh, almost 3,000 people attend from all over the world. Uh, it was so successful. One of the participants decided to open up a gallery in the virtual space, and she is not tech, technically savvy, but she had such a good time she did this. And just about a month ago, she, she emailed us and said that she's in her gallery once a week. She sells work from her gallery all the time. So she sold more work in the past two months than she has in the past five years. So, uh, uh, so it's, it's to me, that's, that's, that's the amazing thing about the world. There, there's all this technology out there that allows you to be your true self or pretend to be somebody else, and then you can be successful uh, as And then you, you can control that in success. It's a little overwhelming thing. So, so I think they kind of go hand in hand. That navigation will be difficult, but the, the opportunity is way, way beyond what I would have managed just 10 years ago. What my students would, would be able to do. Oh, thanks. Hopefully they kind of answer something. <laughs> so they will. Freedom and taking control, freedom, freedom to be who you are and the ability to take control and how it's presented to the world and the terms of success and, um, and how it's yeah. is going out there, basically. Definitely. Thanks. And more to be somebody or not, if you want to be. If you want to be. Troy, <laughs> top that. that kid? Oh no. Um, I guess um, I find today's world very overwhelming. Um, uh, so to me, being an artist in today's world um, allows you not to be in today's world. Mm. <laughs> you know, because I can go in and research ancient Peruvian textiles and be in ancient times. Um, so there's something about being able to leave it behind that I think is saving me and probably has over, art has always saved me in many ways, but um, I think being able to get away from it, it, it allows you to get away from it uh, and can, you know, do your own research. Um, it allows you to connect with people who all might feel the same. Um, I mean, I, I really love outsider art and artists with disabilities, and that's a whole world that I don't think participate in today's world. They don't participate. You know, they, they, they're either lack of knowledge, lack of schooling, lack of, or because of their disability, or, um, you know, they can make wonderful, wonderful work without all of this crap, <laughs> you know? And um, so, you know, I mean, I guess that's my answer. <laughs> if that makes any sense. I love it. Access to other worlds. 
inquiry. So uh, I, I, I would think on the panel, I'm the closest to like what the what the current students are experiencing in contemporary art world. Like I'm, I'm heavy on the Instagram and social media, and I think that's a big aspect of art world. Let me in now. <laughs> The art world now, I think it plays a big part into that persona, persona aspect of it, that the, the artist is really what people are interested in, and their work is a product of themselves. Uh, of course, people like the work as, as, a, like as images, um, but I, I think people are really interested as the, in, in the artist as a person, and social media does a really good job of creating a space for that where people can maybe not put out themselves, but create some kind of persona or ideas um, that people can just follow with. So it's not as, uh, and, and they choose to follow it. It's not like, uh, oh, this person was on the cover of juxtaposition, so therefore I should know about them. Um, then, you know, you pick and choose what kind of art or artist, which is people that you're interested in. So that's something that I really appreciate about the contemporary art world. Something I would change, um, and I'm glad Seth mentioned virtual reality, was uh, I still think gallery spaces uh, are a bit hard to come by for as artists, and uh, I think the piece within a space uh, says a lot about it. So if you can't get your pieces into galleries and spaces, it's going to be hard to, to sell or, you know, people aren't, people aren't going to be able to see it, so they won't even know that you exist. Um, or they won't just get the, the fullness of, of the piece that you're creating. And I think you know, I'm, I'm a really big on spaces. Um, if I'm not screenwriting, I'm thinking about installations. So I would like to see more... Uh, galleries or just maybe artists themselves have on their website a virtual gallery like the ones you see today. Like, How cool would that be? Um, of every piece that you create, you could take a picture of it and this, this algorithm creates the piece and puts it in a virtual gallery that anyone anywhere across the country or the world can take a, can take a walk through and they get an idea and sense of how the piece would look in a space and how big it is. Uh, it will also allow for more creation of installation ideas so you can create the installation in a virtual space or already create it in another space and just take a picture of that and put it into your virtual gallery that's always there and uh, it will make it easier to you know, uh, advertise that, that installation to move to other galleries. So that's something that I would, I think is just gonna be a product of COVID art world, but I, I would love to see more of that because uh, yeah, uh, the art as an image is nice, but art, like seeing it in a gallery, is just something completely different. And it's, it's part of the experience myself. So that's something that I hope, and I'm really excited to see like post-COVID art world. Mm -hmm. The ability to put your persona, create a persona, put it up there, and also, and you would like to see the, you know, the um, technology being used to um, negate that sort of world where the gallery is a necessary sort of step for an artist, so taking control and the ability to put yeah. it out there. When I had my, um, space downtown. I was, I was a resident artist at Basin Arts for about three years, and that was where I had my first solo exhibition. Um, <laughs> Jake was um, <laughs> was the gallerist at the time, and he was a really, really, really big help to that. Thank you, Jake. I really do. But that, that was really big. It was being, having a solo exhibition, right? Every piece in here is you, is me, was me. I, I set, I chose where they hung up on the wall and how people were gonna move through the space and how the feeling, I got the feeling before other people did. That was really cool. Uh, and it's that a lot of people aren't, you know, they're privileged enough to, uh, to get that opportunity to, to have a whole solo exhibition. You know, they have to work hard for years uh, until they get that. Uh, the closest thing we get to it as, as, as art students is like our senior thesis where we might get a wall, which is nice, it's great, but you know, it's not like the whole gallery is dedicated to you. 
which is really cool. Um, so I, I think kind of taking it into a virtual gallery space could be an opportunity to kind of get more people to get that feeling of a, a solo exhibition and people see what you know what their work is about. And I think it could open up a lot of avenues and opportunities for artists. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, well, I, I've always thought that um, being an artist, especially in the gallery uh, live environment, it and, and if, if, if you're able to have spaces to show your work, you have a platform and that platform to communicate your creativity and your ideas, whether those ideas are up, and up front in your face or more subtle. But just to me, that's a, 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 a huge privilege to have access to an audience. I, on the other hand, like with the digital uh, and the cyber world, I'm, I need, I have a lot of work to do. I mean, being an artist and being a marketer are two different skill sets and they, they are not always compatible with the, the artist personality. So for me, that's a challenge. So I really, I really appreciate <laughs> having the, the opportunity to share my work in a gallery space. And hopefully I will, I like, I opened an Instagram account, but I've yet to post one thing. It's coming, I swear. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I were a little less modest, but uh, anyway, uh, so that's, that's what I think is wonderful, what, what access you have to community and audience. And then if I could change one thing in the art world today, and this is, you know, like thinking the effects it would have down the road, but to really, really embrace arts in education, and not just visual art, but the performing arts, because if we could cultivate this appreciation and ad advocacy of creativity in, our, in, our, in the youth, and let them pick what they want to study, not, not say, okay, you're gonna take this, art or you're going to take band or you're going to take underwater basket weaving no let the kids like find that voice and the data says you know it helps the kids so i mean i just am waiting especially in our american culture for this embrace i used to always say when i directed the baton rouge gallery oh if we could have two percent of the tiger fans crowd boy howdy what a difference we could make in the world but i, I i'm an optimist and i think that that could happen one day. <laughs> wow. I love that voice. Come on, you young artist. <laughs> um, do you want to present some winners today? Sure. <laughs> Let's do that. Yes, yes. We're, so I, or, I ordered it in the file from first place to the second and third. So traditionally, you do it the other way. Do you want to do it? Top to bottom. Like first place first? Yeah. Let's do first place first. You got it? Oh, yeah, it's wrestling technology. Mm -hmm. oh. Hang in there. I should have given you a warning. <laughs> First place, dear mom. Anxiety <laughs> gave me. Oh yeah. Okay. So this is a work by Sierra Kerr, and it's the our first place, dear mom. The anxiety you gave me. Holds Me Hostage by Sierra Kerr. Wow, that's great. Is she good? Is this person here? She is, yeah. is she on Zoom? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we have a little bit of time for Corey to tell us, for Corey to tell us few words about this? Uh, yes. uh, why, why, tell you why I picked it as first? Yes. Or just my pick. Uh, um, Sierra's artist statement uh, was very intentional, uh, very well thought out. 
uh, just uh, every piece based off of not just the imagery but the artist statement as well too um, uh, and the this you know you could see this in a gallery I think this is here at the ACA right now actually um, um, it just came down, just came down. okay okay yeah yeah um, with this piece yeah uh, it's, it's something that you could see in any gallery and anywhere in, in anywhere uh, it's very well done um, the the title within itself speaks along with the imagery uh, and far I just thought it was a very complete piece uh, the most complete piece that I saw not to say that the other pieces weren't complete and they were all very very great, but this one, this one, you see this, and it sticks out in your head and, uh, immediately, and you can kind of just capture that that uh, that idea. So that's why I chose that as first. Thank you. Moving on. Why am I not seeing this? So this is a work by. I'm gonna hold this. Caitlin Gerard, this is our second place. What kind of milk? <laughs> is it? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Nice. Uh, again, uh, Caitlin had a very nice art, uh, artist statement that was very intentional, and uh, I could tell the place that she was coming from and the, the source that um, they're coming from. Uh, I remember the the difficulty of Brian Kelly's class in printmaking. <laughs> so I definitely it, it's it's um, it got some points for its uh, execution for for colors and texture and all that came together. And I, I thought it was a really really nice piece. Woodcuts and colors. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you. Third place. The Thief, Thief by Brock Sonnier. <laughs> so uh, this piece also just, I think, uh, it just pops in my head immediately. Uh, it's very memorable. Uh, I just have a real, really like the human form and combining the human form and space a little bit of uh, abstraction the the composition of it uh, it's, it almost reminds me of an imagery that I would see in like a, a like an edgy 90s magazine or even more edgy a 90s zine you know uh, and uh, yeah I thought, it, I thought it was really nice really nice and, and for it to have that kind of effect and still be in, in black and white too I, I think the contrast the light really liked it okay. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to our honorable mentions. And each of our panelists chose an honorable mention, and we'll let you. All right. This um, is a stop motion animation by uh, Michelle Lee. Sorry. And it's called Breathe. And I, I chose this. Chose this. I, I, I find the uh, drawing, the gestural qualities of the drawing and the fluidity of the piece were so, uh, I want to say breathtaking, but I mean, I just, <laughs> it, 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 to me, the concept of breath in this day, it, right now, as we're in this pandemic, and the way she handled such a, a big idea with the gestural drawing and the fluidity of the anim animation. and. I just wanted it to keep going on, but I felt so satisfied when it was over. So is there a way I, to see I, it? I just, is there a way really? to play? Is uh, there a way to watch it? Yeah. Can go to the gallery. It's in the gallery. Yeah, it's worth a it's worth a view. And I really loved uh, the monochromatic uh, color scheme because it it just lent itself to the drawing and the animation. Uh, I, I just felt like that really unified the the message. It's beautiful. Thank you. Didn't mean to mess you up. What? I said I didn't mean to mess you up, but I was kind of wanting to watch it as you were describing it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. But do watch it. It's, it's really well, I've seen, I've seen, I mean, I've seen it. In the, yeah, it is a very, very beautiful piece. Yeah. 
Um, we have another video. We'll do it for you. <laughs> Okay. Technology? Should we move and you um, show it in the end? No. Or you got it? Okay. He knows the gallery. No, she didn't. <laughs> That's so funny. It's crazy. There's sound. Um, the next piece, you want to put it up? This is a lithograph by, you going back? Sorry, I thought it was up. <laughs> by Caitlin, again, Caitlin Gerard, Mom and Me. Um, Seth, do you want to introduce this one? Can you? Uh, yeah, um, so this is my selection for the uh, uh, mention. I was just struck at the, I'm a sucker for really great, well, let me backtrack. I wasn't sure if this was a litho or a drawing or what at the time. Lithograph? Um, I think it's a lithograph. I'm um, correct, correct if I'm wrong. Uh, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for a high graphic, wonderfully illustrated uh, images, and I got a great chuckle out of this, uh, and I thought that the drawing really was top notch. It's actually, frankly, very hard to kick from that list of honorable uh, mentions, mm -hmm. so that's why I'm so excited to see that the show. The quality of the work in the department is, is, is wonderful. So, yeah, I just love everything about this little, this little drama. Thank you. And I'm going to wait. You tell me when you're ready. I'm ready. ready. You ready? Okay. Troy? So I, I usually shy away from... Can we watch this one too? I, yeah, we can watch it. I usually shy away from video. Can you Most, wait? Oh, sure. We do it the way you liked it. Don't yeah. <laughs> does, well, boys, I, does this have sound? Because I don't think it had sound when I. So now you'll get to hear the sound of my voice. I hope she doesn't hate this. Or she, she. This is Sarah Daly, Fly on the Wall. Um, like I said, I usually shy away from video, but this really um, stuck with me after I saw it. Um, th just the beautiful uh, shots, um, the light moving across the carpet. It's just so beautiful. This sort of, so it's like time on this side is moving really fast. Time here is moving slow. And there's this sort of outside of this room and inside. She's kind of going back and forth between the two spaces. And I mean, just the beauty of these shots were so stunning. Um, also, a lot of the frames, there, there's a lot of really quiet places where she stops and it's like a, a frame of the figure um, that's really slow. Like here, 
Um, it's one of my favorite shots. It's almost like a still, and she's slightly breathing. Um, it, it really um, just, I just kind of moved me, and, and I kind of couldn't stop thinking about it. And I kept having to go back to watch it again. Um, and just the kind of the idea about the time, the time moving in those two different spaces, and time going backwards. Um, there's this one shot where her hair is hanging sort of slowly down her back, and the water here is just dripping. I love this shot so much. And then she's sinking into the water. I mean, it just, I don't know, I just kind of mesmerized by the piece. Um, and like I said, I normally really shy away from this kind of work because um, I really, you know, you know it's, you're forced to be here for a certain amount of time. Like a painting, you can decide where you want to look and for how long you want to look. When, you're, when a video has you, you have to go from the beginning to the end. Um, and this piece absolutely kept me from beginning to end. And I watched it quite a few times. Um, and there's this sort of, and it kind of begins and it ends. And I love the way it begins and ends. Um, because she's, at the end, she's kind of whirling around and kind of going down this drain. Um, and it's kind of, I think it's kind of a beautiful gesture. Thank you. Well, congratulations to all the winners. And thank you, everyone, for coming and joining us here and here and on Zoom and in YouTube. And I would just say at the end, to, um, I'd like to remind you that the senior show is coming up very soon, so don't miss that. This is a physical show in the real world, and it's really happening. We're so proud and happy for our uh, seniors. And let me check that I'm giving you the right date. I think it starts on the 19th. Yes, we have the people here. Starts on the 19th, our first group batch of, um, of seniors, and we'll be really happy to see you there. Um, thank you, that was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope we do more of this and we meet more again. And good night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Seth. Bye, Seth. Bye, Seth.